Welcome to this afternoon's session on Technologies of Centralization and Control. I am David Allen Greer. I'm a person of three names, which we know is very important in this day and age. We have four distinguished scholars with us, only one of which has three names, and that is Andrew Mead McGee, who is an assistant professor of history at Carnegie Mellon University going down the line, which is not necessarily the same as the order of presentation. We have Madison Whitman, who is working for her PhD in anthropology at Purdue. Next, we have Marie Hicks, who is a professor of history at the Institute of Technology in Chicago. And finally, Michael Castell. I got that right? Yes. Who does not have three names, but does have a beard, and that counts for something. And he is getting a PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago. Our first speaker is indeed going to be Andrew Mead McGee. And if I may get his title. He is going to be talking about programs of control, bureaucratic hierarchies, software implementations, and agendas of policy and power in the US federal government, 1963 to 68. So sir, it is yours. Thank you very much to Professor Greer for chairing our panel. Thank you to my fellow panelists and to the conference organizers. And thank you to the audience for coming out in the post-post-lunch session. All too often when academic conferences are at hotels with convenient bars, when it comes to those sessions that start a little after 2 o'clock, around 2.30, people start to weigh the conference panel content versus the cocktail specials. And I'm glad that you chose wisely coming out here today. So following the theme of command lines, performance, power relating to software, I want to talk a little bit about the US federal government and how software fits into the narrative of authority, centralization, and command in the period from the 1960s to the 1980s using two case studies. Unlike most presenters at this conference, I unfortunately do not have a presentation to show you because most of my actors are staid bureaucrats with bad haircuts and cheap suits. I thought I would spare you that. But I hope I can paint a, a narrative portrait for you of two distinct eras and two narratives that exist in opposition to one another. We start with the early 1960s, 1963, Baltimore, Maryland, home to the Social Security Administration. At that point, the largest information processing entity on the planet. And for 30 years, the uh, largest contractor with IBM for data processing equipment, going back to punch card machines in the 1930s and the original implementation of Social Security after 1935, continuing through the late 1950s into the early 1960s into some of the earliest generations of mainframe computers. The story I want to tell is of a movement that emerges in the 1960s in Social Security and then a parallel but contrary movement that emerges 15 years later in the Veterans Administration. But first we'll talk about Social Security where with the arrival of new commissioner Robert Ball, a longtime Social Security employee but new appointee of the Kennedy Administration. Social Security Administration begins to take on very earnestly the philosophy of Kennedy's Great Society and then that of his successor, Lyndon Johnson, probably Kennedy's New Frontier, and then the Great Society philosophy of his successor in office of the White House, Lyndon Johnson. This notion of how can we use the government, its size, its power, to improve quality of life for Americans? How can we use the newest virtues in technology and management to make things better for ordinary Americans? How can the government reach out a hand and help you? How can the state improve quality of life in general? And officials with the Social Security Administration conclude, beginning in 1963, that the way to do this is through data, data management. Already massive scale information processors, first with automated punch cards, and then with this early generation of mainframe computers, they conclude that what they need is a system designed with IBM to corral 
all of the data they have and that they could potentially have in the future as, an ex as a result of an expansion of social welfare programs to try to create this master database that would allow them to comprehensively tackle broad social issues in American society. The program they developed was called the Total Data Systems Plan. And for the next five years and within the Social Security Administration, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Johnson Administration, it becomes a locus for all sorts of interesting thought on how software, databases, and the technology of computers can become extensions for political ideology and the hopes and dreams of a new generation of young, active liberals working in government. The quote that I've pulled out is, total data systems was an attempt to give concrete form to systems values, concepts, and goals that we all can agree on, according to the official report describing the project. In essence, government officials and since Social Security's Office of Administration and its newly completed uh, division of systems coordination and planning sought to create a comprehensive database system that would allow them to access any piece of information they needed from the central office in Baltimore and have that information added, modified, viewed upon at any of the 650 remote sites where Social Security operated, bureau offices in small towns and large cities, divisional and regional headquarters, and various specialized offices where data processing, entry, and tape storage occurred. As the project mushroomed, it grew in scope and essentially became an avenue for Social Security officials to articulate their desires for transforming American social policy by gathering comprehensive database information on anyone who was affected by Social Security, whether you paid into its system, whether you were a recipient of some sort of Social Security payment. All this information could be corralled and in some vague fashion to be determined later, used to improve quality of life for Americans. This became an obsession uh, within the administration and they attempted to determine how to keep adding on to and using Social Security's existing system of IBM supplied mainframes, continuing the batch processing, centralized computing they were doing, adding new systems to that as Social Security's mandate grew, while leaving open the door for this broader expansion that would incorporate some massive comprehensive database that could be used for purposes as yet undefined. When Social Security was tasked with implementing Medicare and Medicaid in 1965 and 66, they successfully did so by essentially framing the technological aspect of processing new entrants into medical insurance under the framework that had previously existed for the retirement insurance that was processed on a daily basis by the agency. But as their ambitions grew and their scope grew, by the time that early 1970s rolled around, Social Security was viewed less as this pinnacle of computing achievement, the one efficient government agency, everyone agreed, in the 50s and 60s, and more of a cautionary tale of how focus on centralization closed doors to other potential routes for computer use. By envisioning a grand system, Social Security had left behind the emerging mini computer and micro computer potentials that other government agencies explored, and it had deeply embedded itself into a single contractor and a single mode of computing that hardly matched its ambitions at all. Officials trained in systems planning and computing at Social Security, beginning in the mid 1960s, began to populate other computing agencies and bureaus within the executive branch. Their legacy was felt in this push for centralization and this goal of greater, more comprehensive databases. Which brings us to our second tale. Beginning in the late 1970s, 1977, 1978, when in the Veterans Administration, a group of low-level computer programmers increasingly interested in the computer language mumps developed at Massachusetts General Hospital engaged in a low-level rebellion against the higher authority 
central planning and computerized uh, database managers of the agency and from the ground up introduced a new decentralized computer system. This uh, system, the, uh, I, I always forget the actual acronym here of the DHCP, which stands for, uh, I forget the exact acronym, but what it became was a system, some of you may be familiar with Vista, used in a widespread fashion in the healthcare industry today and in government medicine. But the story behind how this program developed is one of decentralization, very similar to the narrative we often tell of looser, hobbyist-focused West Coast computing versus centralized corporate culture East Coast computing. There are some slight differences. But beginning in 1978, uh, a group of individuals who had worked for the National Bureau of Standards moved over to the computing office in the D Division of Internal Medicine at the Veterans Affairs uh, Agency. And frustrated by what they saw as a continued reliance on centralized batch processing computing, they began working through the network of 170 or so hospitals and healthcare facilities, corralling in on the ground programmers to, in a distributed fashion, create a mumps based network that would run underneath the existing centralized software that the central office in Washington of the Veterans Administration used. And there are a number of interesting stories that emerge out of this. The programmers call themselves mumpsters and the hard hats because they saw themselves as doing the hard construction work that the agency brass refused to do. Eventually, after a number of them had been fired for their actions and perceived misuse of agency equipment and materials, they call themselves the Underground Railroad because they saw themselves smuggling modern computing into this staid federal bureaucracy. By targeting individual doctors and lower level agency officials at particular hospitals and VA installations, they showed the adaptability of their type of decentralized computing, illustrating to these on the ground users of information, how responsive a decentralized system could be. Eventually, they showed this technology off at a series of medical conferences, smuggling many computers into hotel rooms, showing them off to doctors and lower level officials, and eventually swaying the <coughs> assistant administrator of the Veterans Administration, Chuck Hagel, bringing him into their side, making him an honorary member of the Veterans Administration, and convincing the authorities in the central computing office that their cause was lost, that the vast majority of programmers on the ground in VA installations favored this sort of decentralized computing. Those are broad strokes. I could get into more specific details, but what I'm interested in in the end is the narrative conclusions that we draw from these two case studies. Social security in the 1950s and 1960s was seen as the pinnacle of government efficiency. This agency that could do no wrong with it when it came to technology that was partnered with the bluest of blue chip American corporations, IBM, in this massive task of providing a social safety net for the American people. Emboldened by their place in government and in American imagination is this untouchable third rail of politics, Social Security planning officials decided to pursue an ambitious, if vaguely defined, goal of creating a master database that would allow them to link all of their informational needs while providing space in the future for expanding the social welfare net from a technological standpoint. However, they attempted to build this on top of their existing network of centralized batch processed uh, computers and were unable to account for changes that would occur both in the computing realm and the broader political sphere. In contrast, uh, approximately 15 years later, a young 
edgier group of programmers on the ground level who saw themselves as rebels, adopted the ethos of the hacker community and attempted to create from the ground up a decentralized network of information exchange that rejected the tenets of centralization and batch processing in the Veterans Administration and successfully implemented their program by not having a broader goal other than sticking it to the man. And their basic principle of responding to user needs on the ground allowed them to accrue allies who eventually proved very powerful in swaying the opinion of the central authorities of the Veterans Administration when they were unable to replicate the kinds of user demanded processes that the mumpsters, the ground level programmers, had developed. What I see here is a story of an agency that had grand ambitions in the case of Social Security and could have successfully pursued them, but essentially presented to the general public, to government overseers and their own employees, the wrong narrative. The narrative of centralization and control that clashed with the popularity of the narrative presented by the Mumsters and the rebels in the Veterans Administration who themselves saw their act of rogue programming, creating a skunk works within the centralized edifice as being the future not only of technology but of responsiveness of government to American citizens. So when it comes to questions of power and performance, we, we take for granted sometimes the contrast between centralized and decentralized computing without necessarily realizing that what separates the two often is not so much procedure or protocol or even ambition, but the ways in which narratives of performativity, the ways in which narratives of usage and narratives of expansion are actually presented so what I think is most interesting about this comparison and what I hope to explore more in this middle early stage project is the way in which software becomes this black box into which ambitious government bureaucrats load their dreams, but the limitations of that very software often determine the political outcome of what it is that they intend to do. Thank you. In the spirit of the last session, if there's a question of fact yeah. or a point of fact, we might do it now for just a minute or two. And if not, if you have more deeper probing intellectual questions, we will save those to the end. So, question of fact. Uh, fact. Uh, just uh, against the background, uh, there was also a discussion going on. Uh, in the American government and in Congress over the issue of privacy. What happens if you have a lot of information that's centralized? Is that a good thing? Does that compromise privacy in America? And that spilled out into the general public as it was going on at the same time in France and in Germany and Great Britain at the same time. So it's a, there's, a, there's a larger tapestry behind that that also uh, profoundly affected the two case studies. Systems plan ran into some opposition from consumer and public privacy groups because of the similar name comparison with the national database that was also to be run out of Social Security. So, as David said, my uh, talk today is entitled Hacking the System uh, Trans Britons Confront the Ministry of Pensions from 1950 to 1970. Um, when we think about trans people in history interacting with the structures of government, uh, I think we often think about policing first, law and punishment. The archives of the London Metropolitan Police, for instance, are full of files of trans people who ran afoul of the law, sometimes simply for being trans or in the parlance of the police at the time for impersonating another gender. 
But in fact, there are a lot of points of visible intersection and interaction between trans and genderqueer citizens and the government, even before many trans and genderqueer people were out in their daily lives. So in this talk, I'm going to show how these points of intersection were fundamentally contingent on technology and computing in particular, and how an ever-evolving centralized technocratic state not only constructed transgender people's identities, but was in fact constructed in reaction to those identities as well. I'm going to try to show how these citizens were users of government resources in a way that makes the social construction of technology, Scott, an important lens to apply in the case of large centralized computing systems, even though these systems were mostly black boxed from their users, and even though it seems like at first glance, I think, that we're looking at an instance of top-down technocratic governmental control. I'm going to try to complicate that picture. So I ran across this issue while I was doing research for my book that just came out. There it is. Um, it's about gendered labor change in the history of computing, specifically about how structural inequality destroys national economies. And while I was doing research for it, I read a lot about the huge Ministry of Pensions computer uh, installation in the British government. Now, after World War II, British government, um, the British government created a massive welfare state that included the National Health Service, most famously, and also all sorts of other welfare and pension benefits for citizens, the so-called cradle-to-grave welfare state, which was aiming to help the country rise from the ashes of World War II and survive austerity. So it wasn't you know, wholly altruistic. And although the welfare state existed prior to widespread electronic computer usage in government, the central government you know, had employed for years a variety of electromechanical machines, like these, uh, for managing the data required for these welfare systems. Um, even though that was the case, these older, slower systems were very quickly becoming inadequate to the growing national bureaucracy and its need to centrally administer social services. Uh, new systems like the VAT, the value-added tax, and the pay-as-you-earn system of employee taxation all but required the speed of electronic systems. The modern welfare state was created by policy in an abstract sense, but by technology in a very literal sense. And within the welfare state, the massive record-keeping required by the Ministry of Pensions and National Insurance uh, meant that they had the largest computing installation in terms of accounts handled in the country and probably one of the largest in the world as well. It handled millions of entries for the recently instituted pay-as-you-earn contribution system and all the payment systems related to old age, welfare, disability, and war injury benefits. Um, initially, the ministry used a LEO II system which is, uh, here's an example, this isn't theirs, but it's an example of that system. But by 1960, it employed an EMIDEC 2400 mainframe for most of their payment processing. And here's an image of one being shoved in a window. This is, again, not the pensions computer, but I uh, like it. Uh, so just to give some sense of the scope and the scale of this installation, the EMIDEC was capable of reading more than 20,000 characters per second from magnetic tape, and it printed out over uh, 20 million annual statements. Reportedly, it worked at the rate of 900 statements per minute, and for its first year of operation alone, it required almost 1,200 miles of magnetic tape which is more than double the length of England, with 200 characters recorded on every inch of that tape. So in the late 1950s, one government employee who had flown supply planes uh, in the WRAF, the Women's Royal Air Force, during <coughs> World War II, um, and who is now essentially a technical writer in an aeronautics research division of the civil service, announced his new name and set about changing his gender identity in the eyes of the government. And while this made headlines, there 
um, are many instances, actually, of private citizens who were not government employees who did much the same thing. And nearly all of these remain submerged, even though they also interacted with the government. From the 1950s through the 1970s, hundreds of transgender British citizens, so far I've been able to find about 600, wrote to the Ministry of Pensions to try to get the gender designated on their pension cards changed to match their identity. Here's a slide that shows just one page of the many lists that the government kept of people who wrote in asking for record changes. You can see it's numbered into the hundreds and it goes up from there. Now, for some reason when I FOIA'd this file, um, at the UK National Archives. The archive didn't choose actually to redact any of the names in the file. But since, unlike John Ferguson, whom I just mentioned by name, most of these people appear to be private citizens who never made it uh, into newspapers, I have redacted the names on this slide for the time being. Um, but I wanted to show you one, just one page of these lists to give you a sense of the scope and how many people were contacting the ministry and what kinds of information the government was keeping on each of them. I should also say that behind these lists, there were files. There was a paper trail for each one of these names where bureaucrats would argue at length over the credibility and the worthiness of each individual case, talking at length about how they perceived each person's request, character, and gender. The reason so many transgender citizens collecting benefits from the government were writing in was not simply a matter of wanting to change the gender on their cards for personal or political reasons. At this point in time, women were still legally paid less than men for doing the same work. This was the explicit norm. And so women were entitled to less in the way of welfare payments because they paid less into the system. What this meant was that trans women who transitioned in the eyes of the government paid far more into the pension system than they were allowed to draw out if they had lived and worked as men. On the other hand, trans men who were recorded as women at birth, um, who had lived as men perhaps for most of their working lives and had therefore paid into the system at the level of a male worker, they were prevented from drawing out what they had put in because their pension cards still listed the gender they were assigned at birth. You might recall from the article that I showed you a little bit earlier about John Ferguson, uh, that the title of the article is all about how John is now going to be paid more for doing the same job, simply because his gender is changing in the eyes of his employer. So actually, this was an issue for people's livelihoods and affected how well they were able to live in a very clear-cut economic sense. There were also several cases of women who wrote the Ministry of Pensions about their deceased husbands because their husbands had been trans men, these widows were not legally allowed to collect their husbands' pensions after they died, and so they petitioned to basically be accorded the inheritance rights that any other widow would have had. And this is where the computer comes in in a big way. The ministry recognized and admitted the economic injustice of some citizens having paid in more to the system than they were being allowed to draw out, but rather than alter the gender on these pensioners' cards, ministry officials insisted that changing the gender designation was not necessary because the computer did not see gender, <laughs> only numbers. And so all that was necessary then was to fix the numbers on the account. Gender was immaterial. So even though gender was the crux of the problem, in the eyes of the technocratic state, trans pensioners simply required a small workaround in the system. And the underlying problem of their gender being incorrect on their record could simply remain. At first glance, this seems as though the ministry officials were taking uh, on computer or machine logic to address a problem that maybe they didn't understand well. It seems as though they were being accommodating by making the required changes on a case-by-case -case basis, in most instances at least. But behind closed doors within the ministry, the discussion was quite different. Officials were willing to change things on a case-by-case -case basis because they were steadfastly resolved not to change records in a way that would alter the system. 
a system that took binary immutable gender as one of its operating parameters. In files and memoranda that were forbidden from being seen by any civil service officer below the executive level, officials complained that changing gender on pension cards would have the effect of endorsing the behavior and the needs of people whom the government still considered to be perverts. Quote, to issue a man with a card bearing a woman's name, wrote one high-level bureaucrat, might encourage him to believe the department, and thus the government, accepts his change of sex. Even as late as the 1990s, the UK Secretary of State steadfastly refused to be led or influenced by what was happening in other countries regarding recognition of transgender rights, saying that Britain would not be swayed by European laxity. He told the Ministry of Pensions to submerge the issue once again, writing, quote, politically, there is nothing but trouble here. So on the one hand, the ministry often seemed to outward appearances to be accommodating to trans citizens, but internally, the pushback against their claims was clear and pronounced. A workaround in the system was one thing, but allowing trans pensioners to hack the system and actually change its operating parameters in a meaningful way by changing the gender on their records would have been completely outside the pale. Citizens were asking the state to take their identities into account and, return, and in return the state was essentially saying that those citizens were not valid users of the system, which goes to show how the system did not describe and accommodate but rather prefigured and constructed people's identities by designating valid categories. Nonetheless, the persistence and the numbers of those seeking official gender changes, like I said, well over 600 recorded by the 70s, and those are just the ones I found so far, uh, this eventually had an effect. They were more than the state could handle or more than it thought reasonable to handle on a case-by-case -case basis. And in this way, trans users slowly, over the course of three decades or so, began as a class of users to reprogram the welfare state to accommodate them. So in the end, this is an example of two opposing attempts to hack the system. The state attempted to apply a hack to cludge together a workable response for these cases without fundamentally changing their system or its operating parameters. Meanwhile, trans pensioners tried to hack the system in their own way, attempting to get state recognition of their identities in the course of drawing their benefits. Their successes in getting the state to see them were partial and incomplete, but over time they did succeed in changing, in reprogramming this system. Yet, we still regularly confront instances where large centralized computing systems, often in the purview of government but also in industry, are presented as black boxed edifices with no social biases and therefore no social responsibility. There is almost always a long-term struggle involved in getting centralized technocratic citizen, um, te systems to be responsive to users in this way specifically because I would argue we collectively and perhaps unconsciously take for granted the idea that systems actually should construct their ideal users and that this is a strength rather than a weakness of large systems which become pseudo-governmental whether they're deployed within the government or not. And I'll just end by trying to answer the so what question here a little bit. Why should we care about this history, this seemingly niche history? Well, how we get from hacks to infrastructure is a key issue in the history of technology and also in political and economic history, although we talk about it using different terms. Right now, both the US and the UK have political regimes that are trying to hack or perhaps hack away at the systems in place, centering a fictional idea that there is somehow a citizen that can exist outside such systems or that exists a priori, rather than admitting that citizens are constructed in conjunction with the structures that define the state. And so I'd just like to end on this slide with a quote from Quentin Chris. Which he says, in an expanding universe, time is on the side of the outcast. Those who once inhabited the suburbs of human contempt 
find that without changing their address, they eventually live in the metropolis. We might rework this to say that those who once inhabited the exception cases come to define the software of a system. But of course, this isn't an easy or an evolutionary process. Changing software is actually quite hard, and software development by design, that's why we call it development, is a never-ending process. Thank you. Um, until about 10 years ago, um, the retirement age when you could start to draw the pension was 60 for women and 65 for men, which would have made it actuarially advantageous for a man to become a woman, but not the other way around. Did that sort of discussion, did you find those kind of discussions? seen any evidence of that particular discussion yet but if that's the case I'm sure that the bureaucrats in the ministry talked about it nothing got by them nothing like that <laughs> okay further questions yes Thank you. this is a real quick technical question because I can't see but that redacted sheet that you showed the codes would did that say like M to F or F to M is it is Yes, exactly. Over in that column over here, it says, yeah, M to F, F to M, and then it gives a date. Okay. And I believe that's the date of first contact. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a project I'm still working on. It's currently in development, and it's something that I very accidentally came across, which, as you'll see, is a bit thematic. Uh, so. Let's get moving. This is Scraping Glitches, Social Media, and Marginalization. Subscript out of bounds, a frustrating error message. I received this response every time I tried to scrape post-tagged sexual fluidity from the social media platform Tumblr. While irritating at first, I soon discovered the error, along with a few others, gave me a chance to reconfigure how to read gender, sexuality, and marginalization more broadly in data scraping methods. And by scraping, just really quickly, I mean uh, the process of acquiring large amounts of data very fast uh, from the internet in this example or in social media platforms. Uh, and in this paper, I use a glitch feminist analytic in the context of big social media data to retool errors as opportunities to refine our vision to see areas of exclusion and marginality. First, however, I want to provide some background to how, for how I encountered exclusion. While learning the statistical software program R for our computational anthropology course, I designed a small experiment to test the functions of the package TumbleR. TumbleR is specifically constructed for data scraping Tumblr. Because TumbleR, and scraping Tumblr for that matter at the time, and still does not, have dedicated instructive writing attached to it like Twitter and our Facebook, I set out to explore exactly what TumbleR could do, uh, because it wasn't clear. In my initial use of it, I started with a function meant to scrape a tag's 20 most recent posts, and that is what the uh, package itself limits a uh, scraper at. To be clear, the Tumblr tagging system is similar to Twitter's, but a bit different. Like Twitter, tagging on Tumblr relies on a hashtag. However, spaces between words are acceptable, users can attach multiple tags to a post, the tags are not part of the post itself, and posts are not limited to 140 characters. So there's lots more room for uh, more text, more media, much more so than Twitter, for example. Uh, posts can also include text, links, audio, uh, video, images, and even Q&A. Tags function at two levels, sorting within a user's blog and within the overarching tracked tag. For a tag to be trackable, it must be publicly published. If a user's settings are private, the post is not searchable outside of that blog. When I began using the function for scraping tags, I decided to scrape the tag anthropology. The results from the command yielded 20 blog names, my own included, which referred to the 20 most recent posts in the track tag anthropology. I used my own account to post more, noting the appearance of my posts as I repeated the scraping function. However, the success came to a halt as a colleague stepped in. Curious, he created a Tumblr account and made a post taking it hashtag anthropology. When I ran the scraping function again, looking for his post, it was nowhere to be found. 
Confused, we both, we both posted again to Anthropology, and while my post consistently appeared, his did not. When I checked the publicly tracked tags on Tumblr itself, his posts were not there either. I sifted through available information from Tumblr and TumbleR with no explanation. To specify why my post showed up and my colleagues did not, I devised a short experiment with a few other colleagues, asking them to either use existing accounts or to make new accounts to post to hashtag anthropology. Charting their activities on Tumblr, I found a mix of blog duration, or the amount of time a user has had a blog, uh, and total number of posts that a user has posted influence whether or not a post would appear in publicly tracked tags and thus the scraping results. So there has to be some kind of longevity. There are several implications for the social aspects of social media to pursue from these absences, but what this short project led to was, this, was the discovery of another exclusion. While waiting for my colleagues to post, I scraped other tags, drawing from my archive of Tumblr posts, uh, from my own blog. Because I suspected posts tagged with popular tags like music would be buried among other posts, I focused on more specific tags. I had a few posts with tags linked to particular anthropologists or topics within cultural anthropology, it's kind of an academic blog, uh, and I scraped those without any problems. However, I, I soon received my first subscript out of bounds error message. Earlier that year, I had written an essay critiquing an article, and I used the language of the, article artic the original article in the tags, thinking about how to make the post searchable. When I tried to scrape that post, relying on the tag sexual fluidity, I received several lines of red text in response in R. As with the missing hashtag anthropology post, this post did not appear in publicly tracked tags, but unlike hashtag anthropology, it did not even have a track tag meaning that the tag was not searchable at all, nor did Tumblr keep a record of it. I wondered if this absence was related to Tumblr's storied history of censorship, uh, where some tags related to sexuality, like gay and lesbian, were deemed to be adult content and thus could not appear as a track tag, uh, which has been sort of fixed since that happened a few years ago. Uh, but I later found, when I was scraping more, that sexually fluid had a bustling track tag strangely. So I was curious about this, and after testing more and more, I realized that Tumblr does not track obscure tags or tags with so few posts attached to them that they do not seem to warrant tracking. To be clear, these glitches of exclusion are not a product of Tumblr failure, but rather lie with the platform itself and trickle into data. This is a problem, but it's also, also a useful way to jar us into examining systems of power through glitches. The sc scraping glitches point me toward a theoretical reading of errors that provides an opportunity to contextualize glitches within scraping and society. First, however, I want to outline the glitch analytic I use in this reframing. Here I draw from Legacy Russell's 2012 Glitch Feminism Manifesto, where the glitch cracks open systems to reveal structures that are otherwise invisible. In describing her approach, Russell writes, quote, Glitch feminism, however, embraces the causality of error and turns the gloomy implication of glitch on its ear by acknowledging that an error in a social system that has already been disturbed by economic, racial, social, sexual, and cultural stratification and the imperialist wrecking ball of globalization may in fact, may not in fact be an error at all, but rather a much needed errorum. This glitch is a correction to the machine, and in turn, a positive departure. This glitch I speak of here calls for a breaking from the hegemony of a structured system." End quote. The glitch analytic, then, is a means to look past the subscript out of bounds message as an error, and instead peer deeper under the hood, increasing the intensity of our gaze. I pair the glitch analytic with Jenny Sundin's usage of high fidelity to describe the taken-for-grantedness of systems and move toward a model of technologies of marginalization, gender, and sexuality. For Sundin, high fidelity is, quote, an ideal of seamless technological transparency, end quote. Sundin posits high fidelity similarly to a Butlerian concept of gender, where gender is a series of repeated performances aspiring to a non-existent original. The moments where performances do not line up, where gender stops running smoothly, where it glitches, if you will, illuminate essential notions of gender for the constructs they are, disrupting the high fidelity of gender. Applied to Tumblr and existing research, to some extent the glitches, through absence, confirm what we already presume to know. That is, the absence of some posts, and thus some users, are not notable or conspicuous, not only because of assumptions regarding how Tumblr operates and the comprehensiveness of scraping, but also because we do not know to look for these absences in the first place. To learn how to look, I claim a cyborg consciousness to better identify glitches, 
Gary Lee Downey, Joseph Duma, and Sarah Williams proposed cyborg anthropology as a tool for, quote, examining the argument that human subjects and subjectivity are crucially as much a function of machines, machine relations, and information transfers as they are machine producers and operators, end quote. Cyborg's site is finely tuned to navigating what Jeffrey Bowker and Susan Lee Starr describe as, quote, politics of ambiguity and multiplicity, end quote, or spaces in between and outside of normative structures. Paired with what Shayla Sandoval deems consciousness and opposition, akin to what Donna Haraway has laid out as situated knowledge, Cyborg's site, as an occupation of multiple social and technological locations, helps us to see where humans and technology, here is data, meet up. We might start to see such confluence among the glitches I've detailed within big social media data, where data in their absence are technologies of gender, sexuality, and marginalization. And those data and their inclusion in or exclusion from an analysis drive what high fidelity encompasses. At the level of methods, I've restricted myself to Tumblr as I have not explored Twitter or our Facebook beyond a surface investigation. I have, however, scoured the method sections of Tumblr research that uses big data. I have not seen the Tumblr glitches documented in any publications analyzing big social media data from Tumblr. Moreover, while these analyses regard their scrapes as glimpses, they are taken to be complete and holistic glimpses. Tom Belstorff, Bonnie Nardi, Celia Pierce, and T.L. Taylor find that scraping is frequently, quote, viewed as a uniquely comprehensive methodology with sources such as logs, automated activity records, and repositories framed as complete, objective, a God's eye view of an entire digital world, end quote. Similarly, in posing provocations for big data, Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford discuss a fallacy. It claims that big data are accurate or are accurate in total. They assert that, quote, without taking into account the sample of a data set, the size of that data set is meaningless, end quote. And the presence of absences in a data set from Tumblr is demonstrative of this. The guise of wholeness is important because when tags like sexual fluidity and their corresponding users and content are left out, their exclusions can uphold more normative notions of sexuality. This is not to say that scraping reinforces a heteronormative matrix, but rather that some categories and identifications already on the margins of sexuality, for example, become further invisible. When I regard big social media data as a technology of marginalization, I mean to say that the tagging system curated by Tumblr limits the options for how a user can access community and content. When the tags translate into data, the data-directed discourse, when a data set considered to be holistic does not include a marginalized category, that category is not part of the conversation, reinforcing the existing categories of, as what is possible. While some categories through tags have the potential to emerge as less obscure, their absence in the here and now skews our perceptions of representation and to follow up on the sexual fluidity tag, sexuality at large. Part of data as a technology of marginalization is grounded in interpretation. That is, the site of the sorter is at play. As I wrote this paper, I toggled back and forth between this document, Facebook, and a new Chrome extension I recently added called Data Selfie. Data Selfie tracks my activity on Facebook, likes, write in, and how long I hover over a post. It uses this information to predict details about my life, my gender, my political affiliations, and even my intelligence. The API operating under the hood suggested that my psychological gender was, quote, female, 55th percentile, before switching to male, 54th percentile. <laughs> Without even pursuing what that might mean, what if I were non-binary or trans? My point is that the structure of the API by design might not be able to see me, not out of malice or purposeful exclusion, but because these cyclical processes of making and maintaining gender comprise a system that has slipped into a form of high fidelity where interpretation becomes an invisible part of the machine, that, quote, ideal of seamless technological transparency, end quote. When this interpretation then directs the advertising I see, shaping the options available to me, the corresponding data have a performative property. Rita Rayleigh, while discussing this creep of data in the context of more blatant surveillance, writes that, quote, the composition of flex and bits of data into the profile of a terror suspect, the regrounding of abstract data in the targeting of an actual life, will have the effect of producing that life, that body, as a terror suspect, end quote. By producing a subject who is apparently unintelligible to a sorter or an API in a way that misreads them, smoothing now a glitch body or a glitch subjectivity by forcing them into a legible form, this type of social sorting becomes an instrument of marginalization. 
When some likes and flicks or behaviors coded as masculine or feminine with no alternatives, those classifications have consequences. And one is that the high fidelity of normative categories and the utility of big data remains intact. The inability of the sorter to see and comprehend, whether it's through incorrect gender classification on data selfie or the exclusion of obscure terms for sexuality in my Tumblr experiment, is indicative of a machine breaking down even as under a more normative gaze it appears to be working properly. Sundin reminds us that machines are always moving toward a state of failure, that gender in particular is always already broken. And so the glitch is a way to call attention not only to the partiality of a single data set, but also to how we understand the relationships between social positions, data, and ourselves. The glitch then is an opportunity to pause and look at the broader socio-technical systems within which the glitch can arise. No longer an error message to be dealt with, the glitch is a vital moment for disruption. The glitch invites invention and intervention, a window to imagine beyond existing structures. Looking forward as we look under the hood, I ask how glitches, as they emerge on platforms and echo into big data assemblages, set the limits of what is possible for how we understand gender and sexuality, in addition to how glitches stage the social, digital, and material conditions for how people at the margins of society occupy spaces, including but not limited to Tumblr. While the reach of the glitch is in process, the glitch itself leaves us with options to better see and illuminate who is made invisible in data and part ways from presumed high fidelity. Thank you. And before we let her go, questions, factual or similar nature? Yes, Dave? Forgive me if I'm not understanding the technology and the screen correctly, but it sounds to me like um, the tool you're using is using kind of a pre-made interface with Tumblr that allows you to look at the Tumblr data only in certain ways. Uh, I would say, so yes, that is true, but I, the glitch itself that I'm talking about is a problem with the platform. I think regardless of what breaking mechanism I were using, it would still show up because uh, it's an issue with Tumblr's tagging system itself, and I don't think that an intervention in the mechanism of breaking would necessarily solve that. Would the glitch be there if you could do a full text and image search across all of the Tumblr hardware? It would still be there. It, it, yeah, that's Yeah, because you get the same issue out of the app. of when something will, when enough time has passed or enough posts with that hashtag will elevate it to the status where it is actually recognized? Tumblr itself does not. I've looked quite a bit and I haven't been able to find it on Tumblr, but single Tumblr users have posts about how to strategically tag print to what they will show up. And, and sort of the follow-up. So let's say your colleague begins aggressively tagging things mm -hmm. in anthropology. When uh, he or she is elevated, does that mean all of the previous posts with that tag will show, or just points posts from that point forward? This is a memory question because I have tested this. It, so it's ten posts that seems to be the sweet spot for when posts start showing up in publicly tracked tags, uh, and I don't. I think they do retroactively post, but that's with an existing publicly tracked tag. And I don't know yet what happens for tags that were previously untracked and then maybe become trackable. Question would, there, um, would you give a name, sort of a 1A, 1B question, would you give a name to the kind of method that you use to, you know, basically this sort of collaborative, almost reverse engineering of the architecture? Uh, have you seen that done elsewhere into, with success? Would you, would you and your uh, colleagues put together, and would there be a way to scale that much, much bigger to systematically reveal, which is not on particular terminologies, but to, to actually kind of, in some sort of systemic way, try to figure out a census of 10,000 hashtags that are nowhere in, that you couldn't even find your way through a search? So if, immense implications. Right. That would be that would be a that would be a <coughs> cartography of, of, of glitch and, and then an incredible comparative possibility for these kinds of things that you've done so well with one term. So I would also ask what is success in this instance? 
to, to not have just revealed one hashtag that you came across through your own volition, but to actually systematize the process by which you can reveal that which you don't even know to look for? Well, that's the question, right? How do you find, how do you search for something that isn't searchable in the first place? Like, I found these because my research more broadly beyond this is about uh, non-normative gender and sexuality, identification, positionalities. Uh, so in some instances, for example, some of these obscure tags are the names of bands that haven't gotten off the ground, right? Um, or there, I, I don't even know what the extent of those obscure untracked tags are. And then there's also a question of would we even want to track some of them in the first place? <laughs> not, and I'm not saying that in an insulting way, but as a, so there are plenty of Tumblr users who have blogs that are publicly available, but that aren't, that they post to anonymously. And so that ability to track might detract from their ability to keep posting in a candid way. Um, or I've seen plenty of blog users who don't actually topically organize their tags. So there's a point where it would become overwhelming, uh, and it's hard for me to say what that would actually look like. Because if they're not tracked in the first place, I guess I don't have the uh, software uh, know-how to understand how to put that into motion. And we've had a number of different approaches to issues that range from the more uh, technological or systems-oriented issues of control and centralization to those that are more the human design of the system and interpretation. So where do we begin our discussion? Okay, good start here. something, there's some sort of, I mean, I, I understand that those texts are coming out of the literature by those individuals. Those aren't your words. Those are... Uh, no, that, 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 kind of, that kind of works. That kind of works. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 think I agree with that perspective more than I agree with the idea that we can bring everything into one magic centralized. Right, and then, and then the reason talk where, where, where actually, someone is actually coming to the decision that for, for these Solutions not to be worked around, but to be systemic changes, would itself be a state level endorsement of, uh, of an identity category which is socially or culturally, legalistically understood as deviation, itself is an acknowledgement of something which is also very hard to kind of communicate, which is maybe the systemic X, systemic Y. That it's, it's almost as if they're fully conscious of the idea of. The, the politics of technological artifacts and infrastructure in a very explicit way, so much so that they're saying, we are not going to change this. So and so, it, is there, are these aberrations, or, or is there some kind of process where systems builders, uh, regardless of what they we would want them to do um, in a political sense, but that they are, in fact, on the one hand, when they're behind closed doors having these kinds of conversations, there is actually a great deal of organization savvy about the politics of infrastructure and so forth, that somehow there's like a membrane beyond which discussions of that sort don't extend, and then you start getting into ideas of technological and social utopianism and the neutrality of technological objects, the neutrality of infrastructure. Uh, it's, I'm just wondering what if there, is, if there is such a membrane, why this kind of conversation doesn't move out beyond that membrane? seems very explicitly and self-aware in, in that slide and in the example of, again, the politics of infrastructure. But if I talk to one of my students at Stanford from CS and I talk about the politics of technological objects, there can be moments of just, you know, but then suddenly they go into these doors and, and these conversations are going on at explicitly explicit time periods. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm stating my question well enough, but there's a mismatch I'm trying to understand. I mean, I, 
I would say actually that what you're describing, you know, techno utopianism on the And one I think hand, we want to use microphones, correct? Okay. I look at our AV guy. Microphones are good. So I would say that what you're describing, the sort of techno utopianism on the one hand, and then in opposition, this idea that, you know, a state or maybe a corporation or an industry has a very strong vested interest and a you know, political savvy as they're constructing their systems. I think those are two sides of the same coin. I think that techno-utopianism, just by its very nature, uh, by its very nature, is in fact a political stance. And we can talk about all of the ways in which it's rooted in particular types of privilege, but I think even just as is, techno-utopianism is political. And I think that when we look at, you know, people doing things in the British government's case, at least, it was very explicit. They were very um, obsessive about the political implications of the hardware they used, the software they used, from whom they purchased it, if it was British, and so on and so forth, because they saw American influence and eventually American control creeping in through computing technology, and they were terrified of this. So in that case, it was very conscious, it was very explicit, but I think that even when it's not, and you kind of alluded to this, I think, in the case of your, like, stubbornly apolitical, you know, undergrad, um, it, it's, it's still there, and it maybe is a matter of people not admitting it or recognizing it, but that's more about how we're describing things than maybe about the, the nature of it. So, um, yeah, I, I sort of think they're, they're actually very twinned and not, not in opposition. Well, I can throw in a, a quote that in sort of uh, in the same vein with this technological optimism with this total data systems plan uh, in the report sent to Congress to justify funding for uh, expansive new mainframe systems. Social Security Administration officials wrote that the purpose of such a system is to obtain data for planning, control, and appropriate social purposes. And the ultimate end goal is to attack the conditions which impede progress. The idea is that it's the database that will push forward our ability to plan for the future. So the technological utopia will actually emerge from our proper ability to manipulate data. This whole conversation is kind of interesting because uh, at a different level, and that is, Government officials tend to be more sensitive about politics uh, and implications. And this is true in any country that you look at in the industrialized world, and even behind the communist curtain, although it's, it's a different conversation there. So there's greater sensitivity there than you would see in the private sector. In the private sector, you also have those conversations, but you have one other thing going on in the private sector, and I don't know to what extent in the public sector, and that is you've got senior management taking a position on something, but then since there's delegated authority down to the various departments, you've got incremental changes going on that may be accidentally contrary to what the senior management is doing, or may by accident be complementary to it, but clearly not necessarily purposeful in that sense. It's driven by whatever uh, folks down here are being measured on. Budgets, uh, sales, whatever that old thing is. And that may be contrary to what the corporation is doing. Public sector, on the other hand, you see a, a, a tremendous amount of discipline and coordination. Things, people worry about the optics of whatever decision they're making. And they even create uh, methods to uh, countervail whatever the policy is. So, for example, my favorite, favorite example of, uh, during De Gaulle's uh, uh, rule in France, he he didn't want American computers being used by the French government. However, the military came to him and said, "I'm sorry, we got to use our new equipment because it's the standard that NATO uses. And I know we don't like NATO, but if we ever get..." invaded by the Russians, we're going to call NATO up to, uh, to take care of us, and we've got to be able to coordinate your data. And so he allowed the, uh, the Army and the Air Force to buy a ton of ideal equipment. 
And yet he was getting on television and saying, before you buy any avian equipment, for God's sakes, consider the French equipment or the British equipment before you buy Amer American. Other thoughts? Yes. I think my question is just for you, Michael. Um, thinking about um, in some of the those kind of message passing models, <clears throat> I was interested, I could be wrong, but I believe these sorts of models of between an object sending a message to a specific other object as a recipient, or like publishing the message and having the relevant object say, oh, that's for me. Um, was that not kind of looked at in these object-oriented programming languages before? That part A, and I'll, part B would be, um, if you take like the system using this middleware as an exchange instead of like a trading outfit, are these message broker systems like the object of attack for high frequency trading, like for things like quote stuffing and things like that? Is that is this like the part that breaks when like a high frequency trading algorithm goes against an exchange? I, I both I'm just curious. Yeah, so I kind of left the whole, I mean, a lot of uh, also happening in the 90s is the interest in objects and, and making databases object-oriented and making programming languages object-oriented. Um, the, 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 um, in object-oriented terminology, there is a pattern, the observer pattern, which is kind of the uh, subscribe, notify pattern, but it's not a broker type situation. It's just kind of like you can register to be notified when something happens. Um, so if you look, go back to like the, 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 um, uh, design patterns book. That's the observer pattern. Um, I don't know if there's a if there's an object oriented culture name for the message broker. I didn't sort of see one, but maybe I mean it might be out there. And like I said, um, you know, uh, 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 graphical user interfaces uh, uh, like you know X Windows, uh, Smalltalk uh, also use this kind of like events that they re they invented this event system kind of like separately from the financial uh, uh, actors. Um, uh, well, it, it's in part before and then in part it's happening kind of at the same time. So some of the reinventions still are happening in the late 80s and early 90s, yeah. Um, but as far as I can tell, there's not a huge amount of direct influence there. There might be a little bit uh, of evidence that, that, that some of the message queue developers were inspired by uh, the uh, uh, Xerox PARC people. Um, uh, and so the quest second question was kind of asking about uh, exchanges as opposed to, say, uh, brokerage firms, right, yes. want to use this technology. So exchanges are definitely using uh, uh, th these techniques mainly as publishers, right? So when something happens, they need to broadcast, right, uh, like a new quote or a new transaction, right? And so, so they're invested in this probably almost more than anyone else, but they might be using, in my, it, like my understanding, like at, at that time, they were using tandem systems, which are better known as like transaction processing systems, but we're using them to, broad, to, to help broadcast the flow of quotes. Um, but, uh, but your question is more uh, if high frequency traders would take them as an object of attack, meaning what exactly? Like, well, these just strategies of like quote stuffing in exchange to slow it down to get the new. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. I guess I don't know too much about sort of that type of antagonistic HFT where they try to like jam the exchange or something. I mean, see what you're saying, but I, yeah, I haven't read too much about that. But I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, in that case, they would they might be taking advantage of something that they know about the size of the queue on the exchange side when you submit requests to you know. I, don't, I mean, I don't, there's all sorts of things that you can imagine doing, but yeah, like submitting submitting quotes that go onto one queue as opposed to another is certainly something that they do, right? And they they know all the different parameters so that they know if something gets pulled off of this queue before. Uh, some, some order gets pulled off of one key before another, then they're going to sort of route them that way. And uh, your, your average day trader probably doesn't know who the heck is, what, what key they're going on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, here. Um, thanks for the great talks. My question is for kind of everybody. Um, I'm just wondering if there's like, I mean, correct me if, I'm, if this doesn't make any sense, but I'm wondering if maybe we could talk about a kind of like homology across all of your projects in the sense that they all deal with this kind of, um, you know, uh, protocols for kind of like, um, you know, just negotiated sort of like distributed decision making of, of various types. And is there a sense in which kind of like maybe, you know, moving to Michael, that, that these are kind of like, you know, they're all in different ways like difficult questions that have to be negotiated and have to be solved. And in a sense, maybe we're moving towards 
the kind of almost automation of some of that? And then does that maybe possibly be kind of constantly towards like some of these even, um, um, what's the term for the Bitcoin type uh, contracts or whatever? Blockchain. 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 So like, <laughs> is there some kind of like almost kind of, like, if you start with that kind of as the present and then kind of like work backwards, there's a kind of this message passing thing and going back further to these questions of just the way the decisions are made I, I mean, I, I think at least to connect two of the talks, you know, the technology that Madison is using to to scrape Tumblr, right, to choose a hashtag and then have that come as like a, you know, a stream, right? Un underlying that is probably some of the technology that I'm talking about, right? Because you, you need to sort of dynamically create streams of things and you're filtering dynamically and you're all of a sudden you have some process that's listening to a hashtag you've never actively listened to before right but you, you want you need to take some action every time someone posts a new thing so i mean in that case at least there's there's a definitely historical connection between um between, between those two wouldn't it matter what kind of decisions you're making and if they're transaction oriented task oriented you can automate and have a typology and some standard things that go on but the minute it gets nuanced and subtle and ambiguous like politics or sexual orientation whatever it is the hot hot topic sensitive topics that are ill-defined then it remains with the humans yeah i guess that's kind of what i was trying to allude towards a little bit like you know how do we identify and decide the exception or something like that? And to what extent does that eventually, is that eventually becoming kind of increasingly automated through the data? Uh, it's a question of importance, isn't it? Uh, was it? Clinton also in World War I said that war is too important to leave to the generals? We have that going on. Uh, in all, all four presentations, we have that issue going on. We can't let the, the computers or the data processing people screw around with us. You know, just to it, at least in the 60s with Social Security, one of the broadly defined but never actually laid out goals of this total data systems plan was to have sort of automatic adjustment of benefits for anyone in the system, input it anywhere, without having a cascading effect on everything else. <laughs> so there was this desire that the system would self-correct and recognize adjustments without being entirely disrupted to what they call the total flow of data. Um, on the other side, with the Veterans Administration, many of the micro-scale projects being done at these local sites that essentially were lint dump under this monolithic framework were done in direct response to physician requests. You know, maybe the VA hospital in Lexington, Kentucky needed some sort of diabetic database, or maybe the people in St. Petersburg, Florida, needed better tracking for particular kinds of pills. These were done sort of on the ground, on the fly, the idea being that the, the centralized, not quite automated, but sort of broadly defined systems being put out of the headquarters in DC couldn't meet these on the ground demands. So I wonder if this gets at this question of the uh, incrementality when do you design a broad system that can be used for general purposes by everyone? When do you need the more specialized service? Um, well, Dave, uh, just a question for um, Marie and Madison. I was just thinking about um, like the occurrence of a glitch, uh, not in a particular system, but across systems. So thinking of a person I know who in like a federal system has one kind of whatever gender tag, you know, and then in several multiple state and then multiple corporate systems has contrary gender tag. I just was wondering if you had thought about the glitch appearing, you know, at that different resolution or something cross platform. Glitch. I think the glitch, if we're doing this opportunity reading, is, well, it's hard because it's dangerous for that kind of glitch to exist because I'm hearing more and more about those moments where gender doesn't line up with 
within some of those systems as a way for the state to uh, start to detransition people forcibly by saying, no, we don't have evidence of this. So, for example, I heard a really great paper last week, actually, by the scholar named Lars McKenzie, who is working on uh, credit reports that don't ma match trans people's existing statuses and the hoops that people have to try to jump through to get those to match. But that can be used as evidence to then forcibly detransition people by other agencies. So in that sense, the glitch is kind of a moment where it's we can have this horrific realization of what's going on, but it's also like a really dangerous glitch. I think it's just interesting to think about the vocabulary of glitch across systems because as you were talking, I was thinking, well, I don't really have a good example in response to that. But then I was thinking, well, of course I do if I just change the terminology a little bit. Um, you know, the uh, trans pensioners that I'm talking about in the Ministry of Pensions case, you know, they can be seen as there's a glitch in that system, right? Um, but outside of interacting with a particular system where glitch would be the operative terminology, similar things are going on, right? Even, you know, personally, even with uh, the people who live on their street, probably. Um, but it's not conceptualized as a glitch. Um, and so it's interesting how those things differ not just in kind, but also in terms of how we describe them and how much of it is description and how much of it is the, you know, sort of the essence of what's going on. So your question just got me thinking about the, the particular ways in which we're talking about systems in a very, you know, very technocratic sense. This is sort of tangentially related, but I think it affects the, the same area of discussion where marginalized people get categorized in a particular way. And one of the areas where Social Security sort of lost its luster was in the implementation of SSI, Supplemental Security Income, in 1974, I think it was. And part of the reason why that failed was that the federal government assumed payments uh, for the elderly poor and disabled and other categories that had previously not been included under the federal social welfare vote. They, they took on this burden from the states. And Social Security failed initially its implementation. Computer systems crashed. The software wasn't capable of adding all these new accounts. And there were millions of poor people who, had, who didn't fit into the categories that Social Security had previously assigned, where you got money because you were a widow, because <coughs> you came into the system, because you had an accident. These were people who were drug users or who were homeless or who you know, had fallen out of the system and Social Security couldn't figure out how to code them. And there are all sorts of testimonies before Congress where they say, well, these people are the wrong kind of input. Yeah. Can I ask a question about that, though? Sort of a nerdy question. 74, two years after the relational database article in a period when business is struggling to move in quickly, and it's clear people don't understand relational databases. How much did that compound the problem or cause it or produce, in fact, a staff that wasn't ready? Because IBM makes, Jim, the transition fairly quickly. 74th certainly the products out. Well, part of the reason why Social Security was given this responsibility was because they had so successfully implemented Medicare and Medicaid, right. which was built on these pre-existing batch process systems. Batch process, non-relational databases. Yep. And after Cod's paper, the world stands up, the techie world, the nerd okay. world, stands up and says, oh my God, this is the way forward. All modern databases are going to have to do it. And you're describing a database implementation right on that cusp. And I, I suspect that there were probably people within IBM who were still the primary vendor for Social Security pushing for this newer model. But mm -hmm. Social Security at least thought that they could, as the lineage of this total data systems plan, build on to their existing systems. Okay, so in 1974, I was personally trying to convince customers of IBM, because I worked at IBM in sales, trying to convince them to go to relational databases, because that was what we were supposed to go sell. And it was very normal to take two or three or four years to get that done. And, and then, of course, they had to get the resources to do that, because 
didn't know that. You know, that's, at a techie level, you didn't know that. So you had to get that, uh, those resources. So you had to hire them and all that. So you had to go through that process, just like you do if you're hiring another faculty member into your department, right? So you have the same hassle. And, uh, and of course, all the vendors, including IBM, the IBMers had to wrap their heads around this thing, too. And the way you wrapped your head around a lot of this stuff was to figure out a new use that was very specific. Otherwise, you're selling vaporware, and nobody knew what to do with it. You can never sell database for the sake of database. You had to go find a reason to uh, use data, or capture data in a different way, and say, oh, by the way, in order to be able to do that, you need to, to acquire, and then you name the product, IMS, DL1, whatever, whatever you're going to use. So people had to sort that out. Vendors had to sort that out, but the customers did too. And that was a three or four year process. So the tendency of management was always, well, wait a minute, this crazy IBM sales, get them, get them out of here. I mean, we know how to do this. We've been doing this for 30 years. You know, we, we have this database uh, philosophy. Let's just use that and get that crazy Cortana out of here. Pushing some garbage from IBM, <laughs> and, and but then in time they, they they would come to understand. And the exceptions to that were those who who were piloting programs with the vendors. They then collectively the two of them, the vendor and the, and the customer, would learn how to make the software work better and you know, what what uses to use. But you know that, that's a small percentage. It's less than one percent of your your customers. So, like I do have 50,000 customers in these years. Uh, you know, you're only going to pilot with 12 or 15 companies. You know, Ford Motor Company, maybe some U.S. Army uh, application area. So it, the transition is not so obvious. Meanwhile, you got data nation cranking out articles like crazy, saying this is the the wave of the future, and, and you got IBM executives uh, showing up at conferences with beautiful slide decks talking about this is it. Everybody's using it. And Oracle and Informix. But I think for, in particularly this audience, because Jim and I can go on this and we'll go on forever and we'll bore you to tears. Oh, yeah. and, and will, and will. And, and you will just break down and beg to leave and say, my God, can't they be stopped? There is, in terms of people studying social history and anthropology, a shift with relational databases to conceiving the population of whatever you're dealing with, what with people, with transactions, with whatever, as set theory, as a collection of sets and subsets. And when you are dealing with software before that, even the mighty IBM product, and I should say my father was a 40-year um, employee of their largest competitor, um, even the mighty DB2, you would have a population with attributes. And in, in particular, if you look at the debate, which is, for nerds, one of the finest debates you can ever get of setting up Social Security in 1938, whether they're arguing how many attributes can fit on one card, because they're only going to give one card in 38 for all your entire Social Security records. What attributes? And they are deciding about issues that concern all of you up there. Trans, we don't have enough, enough data to put that on the card. That's an attribute. After the 70s, there's an increasing understanding that we are a collection of sets. And how do you manipulate those sets? How do you join them? How do you split and factor them? And that all of a sudden becomes a very interesting thing, so that if you're looking at these things that you're all looking at, which are, I think, deeply important and deeply fascinating, um, and you're thinking in terms of the modern software stack, solution stack, which has a database at the bottom, you're missing the limitations, the intellectual limitations that they had in trying to shape a technology that unifies or controls. Ah, and we have that started something. Are we going to get a good fight going? No, no. I, um, it just, what you're bringing up just raised for me this question, as, as you rightly point out, there's mm -hmm. so many of these issues of how do we describe people mm -hmm. in these systems? How do we reflect the complexity of it? It makes me wonder, as we're talking about these enormous governmental systems and databases, um, because there was a reluctance to admit complexity, but I wonder, and I don't know uh, the equivalent name for the agencies, whatever the equivalent GCHQ tracking system was in that period, because you know they will have had you know, that information in files and correspondence, right? 
And did they actually put that into computers in another way? It makes me very curious because they were they would have been very interested in these details because those systems are built in details about people's lives for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I, I wonder if there was another part of the government that was like, you know, we really want to show the complexity of human beings. <laughs> and so let, let, maybe we can pull up a list that looks like this. And you, you know what I'm saying? I just yeah. wonder if that exists. And I have no idea if that existed in the US or the UK or anywhere else at the time. Jim can talk about it. The answer is that there's the foundation of it now, but it's only about 10 years old. Uh, one thing I think is helpful when you're doing research, uh, particularly in the public sector, is to keep two things in mind. Uh, government is not monolithic. It is a community of silos, and they have different cultures in different places. Go to the State Department, go to the, go to the, uh, the Pentagon, go to the Department of Interior, and you see radically different cultures and philosophies toward uh, technology. And while they all talk to each other, they really didn't pay a whole lot of attention. They, they, they went with their own... Uh, they talk to each other, they don't listen to each other. <laughs> Key distinction. So, it's a highly diverse, you have to think of it as a, as a village, okay? Uh, <laughs> the second thing is that, uh, particularly with national government applications of computing, uh, they're so massive. And one of the problems, is, as one public official told me years ago, is just changing the system, uh, you have to be able to continue to drive the car while you're changing the tire on the car. We cannot stop. And the person who told me that was an IRS official who was saying that you know, every day we bring in X number of hundreds of millions of dollars at the time, you know, like every hour. So you can't turn off the computer for an hour because it'll cost the nation, you know, $300 million. So how do you change a system that's massive and all by the way, you screw it up, you, screw, you, you uh, affect hundreds of millions of people. I mean, the order of magnitude, it's an order of magnitude above whatever you're a little IBM or some tiny little company like IBM would do in comparison. Because IBM was tiny in comparison. So whether it's the British government, which is much smaller than the federal government, or the French government, which is larger, I mean, it's, you've got this level of complexity at the same time that you've got, it's a village of different communities. Mm -hmm. And, and just as sort of a measure of that, the, the efforts to unify it starts with the Electronic Government Act of 2004. So it's a Bush era one. They took, pardon? Oh, Marie, go ahead, please. I didn't see you. Oh, um, I think that's a really astute point that you make, Eileen. And I, I think you're 100% right. And Jim, you kind of alluded to this too. It's not about not being able to handle the complexity, right? It's about difficulty of change, but not even that. I would say it's about reluctance to change. And it's about actually wanting these systems to actually um, cohere in such a way that they can somehow make real a fiction of stability mm -hmm. that does not exist and never will. But there is constantly, as I'm sure you've seen in your career, there is constantly that um, attempt to believe in that fiction in such a profound way that exactly, you know, what you were describing, Eileen, happens. So, yeah, it's not about the complexity. It's, it's really not. Yeah, and, and my point that f feeds into that is the CIO Council is 2004. It took them, uh, Electronic Government Act, three years to get a CIO Council and then another five or six years to get the legislation to be able to do anything. And so we've had like 17, 15, 16 years of it that is a fiction of, uni of, of centralized control. And question here. Uh, this, back in the 80s, uh, it was a problem when I we moved down to the U.S. Uh, and when I married, I did not take my husband's name. This caused the most enormous problems in registering for anything, uh, buying a house, getting credit, um, all of these things because the computer systems were simply not set up down here for that thing. I mean, it's not a problem now, but back then it was tremendous. I remember once having a long argument with a lawyer about something a uh, small payment for a transaction, and he insisted 
that I, since I was married, I had to sign it with my husband's name, and he only showed up when I pointed out that I could do that for him, but the account was in my name, and the bank did not receive it. <laughs> so, maybe what it needs to be one of your systems, there has to be kind of a critical mass, at which point that it becomes a, uh, either economically viable or socially critical enough to change the system, but it guarantees there is always going to be this periphery socially of, of people who simply cannot be accommodated oh, by mm -hmm. the system. Oh, it oh, may change what that category is, mm -hmm. but the demand, the, the, just the mass nature of the situation. And they appear instantly. The first day you fire up the system. And you go, oh, 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 oh. The exception. Well, we've had a lovely discussion, and I know by holding you, we're holding up the rooms and keeping you from getting coffee, and we didn't want that to happen. So let's thank our speakers once more, and thank you all for coming.